One of the greatest challenges for any communicator of God's word is to serve as a bridge builder for the ancient text. The fact that we are more than 2,000 years removed from the time period and culture of the original context of the book of Hebrews makes it difficult for modern readers and hearers to comprehend and to relate to what we see here. Everything in our world is so different from that of the first century. So we often have trouble relating to that ancient setting. And yet, biblical truth requires that we understand what the original message was to the original hearers before we try to apply it to our contemporary culture. And those who fail to do that inevitably end up distorting the scripture and misapplying it, sometimes even to the degree of falling into gross heresy. But here at Parker Bible Church, we want to get it right. So we have to go back into the world of the first century and understand the original message. And part of doing that means that we recognize some differences between the ancient world and that of our own. We have to grasp ancient Judaism. We have to understand certain ceremonies and religious practices that may be very foreign to us. And although we live in the age of the new covenant, we first need to understand the old covenant and how it compares with the new. The book of Hebrews really is a book of comparisons and contrasts. And the truth of the matter is, we can never really appreciate the new covenant until we first understand the old so we can compare it uh, to that covenant. And all these elements of ancient Judaism really are important because They help us have a better understanding of what we have in Jesus Christ. The particular passage that we are focusing on this morning, chapter 9, verses 1 through 14, helps us really to compare the earthly with the eternal. But before we get back into it, let me just give you a couple of issues that I think we have to be aware of as we seek to bridge this gap between the ancient world and our own. One of those challenges has to do with the understanding of sin and morality. There has been a huge cultural shift away from a biblical understanding of sin and morality in our day and time. And I'm sure you know that the trend in our time has been to deny any sort of universal ethical standard and to adopt one's own system of morality. People today pull from a number of different places, from parents, from friends, the media, movies, TV, etc., and construct their own understanding of right and wrong. On their list of what is right and wrong might be things like tolerance is right, exclusivity is wrong, or free choice is always right while any kind of restriction is wrong, or helping others is right and harming others is wrong. And the whole framework for this new morality is the concept of being true to yourself. And the whole idea is as long as you're not hurting someone else and as long as you're being true to yourself, then you're good to go. We no longer want to ever label anything as sin because we don't want to embrace the idea that there could be a universal standard of morality that is not found in ourselves but is 
decreed by God. But the, the biggest problem, of course, for the gospel is the fact that when people begin to adopt this new understanding of sin and morality, then there no longer is an understanding for the need for atonement and forgiveness of sin. Most people today see themselves as basically good because they naturally conform to their own moral standards. So why would they need any kind of atonement for sin? And our answer to that is that we must always communicate the biblical standard in spite of what our world thinks. We must warn people that God is the one who sets the standard and he doesn't grade on a curve. He is the one that we will ultimately answer to. It's not what we think that counts. It is what he declares. Now, related to that is the fact that the concept of the shedding of blood has become very foreign to our generation. The idea of animal sacrifices is considered extremely primitive and dark to many people today. And there's this vast movement to protect animals from any kind of cruelty. And so the sacrificial system under the old covenant in Israel would be understood today as barbaric and horrendous. Because of these sensitivities, there have been movements within the church to remove any references to the blood from all of our hymns and our sermons. But what is the problem for the gospel here? It is the fact that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. The problem is that we're in danger of losing the truth that all that shed blood under the old covenant was a foreshadowing of the precious blood of Christ that atoned and cleansed us from all our sin. This has led to a trivializing of the cross. Author George Guthrie says, the cross of Christ, once respected, if not reverenced, as a significant religious symbol has undergone a transmutation. For a vast host of people today, the cross is simply something you wear around your neck, and you can even get one with a little man on it, right? The concept of the blood sacrifice to atone for sin has become lost in our day and time. It is now a primitive idea that has become completely irreconcilable to modern thinking. But once again, folks, we cannot give an inch. We must declare boldly and clearly what the Bible proclaims. Theologian John Stott wrote, the gospel contains some features so alien to modern thought that it will always appear folly to intellectuals, however hard we strive to show that it is true and reasonable. The cross will always constitute an assault on human self-righteousness and a challenge to human self-indulgence, but, he says, its scandal simply cannot be removed. Folks, the bottom line is we need to take back ground that we have lost. We need to help people today understand a biblical understanding of the cross and the sacrifice that it represents. Why? Because our world desperately needs to hear in a fresh way that God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son to die in our place on a cruel Roman cross to atone for our sins and to give us eternal life. We must 
never abandon the concept of the blood atonement for it is the centerpiece of the biblical gospel. Well, all all of that is just for us to keep in mind as we come to this passage of scripture. In Hebrews 9, 1 through 14, the old and new covenants are contrasted. And as we saw in part one last week in verses 1 through 10, the author gives us the characteristics of the old covenant. Well, in verses 11 through 14 that we're going to look at this morning, he gives us the characteristics of the new covenant. Last time we saw under the characteristics of the old covenant, and we're using John MacArthur's outline here, we saw the old sanctuary, verses 2 through 5. We saw the old services in verses 6 and 7. And we saw the old significance in verses 8 through 10. We're going to have the same basic outline this morning, but here is the other side of the contrast. So in verses 11 through 14, we now see the characteristics of the new covenant. And beginning in verse 11, the author of Hebrews moves to the Christological arguments of the son's superior sacrifice for sin. The conjunction but highlights the contrast. In the previous section, 1 through 10, we saw two key weaknesses of the old covenant. We saw that it did not allow any true access to God. And we saw where its sacrifices were temporary and could not deal with the conscience, the inner man. But that section ended with a time limit. These weaknesses only last as long as until the time of reformation. And with the coming of the new covenant, those weaknesses are overcome. And again, we see the very same three aspects for the new covenant, beginning with the new sanctuary. Look with me at verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things to come... He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, has an infinitely greater sanctuary in which to minister. And yes, the old tabernacle was designed by God, but it was made of that which is part of this created order. As a result... It was temporary and subject to decay and destruction. In fact, the temple, which is patterned after the tabernacle, was completely destroyed in 70 AD. In contrast to that, however, the more perfect tabernacle in heaven is not made of that which can perish. It is not made by human hands, but by God himself. In fact, this heavenly tabernacle is heaven itself. It is the throne room of Almighty God. This is the real tabernacle that Christ has now entered on the basis of his shed blood. The priest in the old tabernacle had to enter with the blood of bulls and goats temporarily covering their own sin and the sins of the people But Jesus Christ has entered on the basis of his own blood, as we'll see in the next verse. Before we get to that, though, let me just point out that there is a textual variant in verse 11 that scholars have vigorously debated. The New American Standard reads, Christ appeared as a high priest of good things to come. The English Standard Version has Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. Another translation has the good things that are now already here. Peter O'Brien explains this textual variant in his commentary. It's a fairly 
complex explanation of all the different manuscripts and how they word this. But my conclusion is that this is another example of the already not yet. The phrase Christ appeared is in the aorist tense, which means this is something that has already taken place. Herschel Hobbes says that refers to the historical fact of his incarnation, which of course includes all of his redeeming work in history. The good things seem to represent the sum total of the blessings of the new covenant. These are blessings that Christians are experiencing already in the here and now, but they're blessings that will not be fully experienced until that future state of glorification. Now, I don't know if that solves the problem of the textual variant, but I do believe this is a good way of understanding the blessings of the new covenant. We have three tenses in our salvation. We uh, have regeneration, we have sanctification, we have glorification. We have the already not yet aspect of our salvation. In fact, there is a sense in which positionally we have already experienced the heavenly access to God, that Christ has already taken us into the presence of God in a spiritual sense. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, Paul said, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The use of the past tense there implies that we are already there, spiritually speaking, in heaven with God, that we are right now in the very presence of God in the heavenly throne room. But of course, we understand this is speaking of positional reality. The truth of the matter is someday it will become actual reality. But I think the best way to understand verse 11 is to say that now that Christ has appeared in him, the shadows have given way to the perfect and abiding reality. And there's really a ring of victory in this verse. Christ has opened the door of heaven and he has provided full and permanent access to God. So there's no reason for us to go on in the guilt of our sin. We can experience his eternal redemption. Well, there's a second element that we see here, and that is the new service. Look with me at verse 12. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. The services of the priests under the old covenant had to do primarily with the offering of sacrifices. Access into the holy place, and in particular, the holy of holies, was always through blood. But the atoning work of Christ was distinct from that in three ways. First of all, he offered his own blood instead of that of animals. Secondly, His sacrifice was a once-for-all sacrifice rather than having to be offered over and over again. And thirdly, he was able to obtain eternal redemption for those who belong to him. Now, the word obtained there in that verse is in the aorist tense, signifying this is once for all. His offering was an all-sufficient one-time offering that secured eternal salvation to all who are in Christ. But there are a few details I want you to note here in verse 12. First of all, there are some translations that give the wrong impression in this verse. For example, the Revised Standard Version has, 
he entered once for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood. Now, the problem with this is that it has led to some wrong conclusions about his atoning work. F.F. F. Bruce writes, there have been expositors who have argued that the expiatory work of Christ was not completed on the cross, was not completed indeed until he ascended from the earth and made atonement for us in the heavenly have holy of holies by the presentation of his efficacious blood. In other words, that his work wasn't finished on the cross, he then had to take his own blood literally into the heavenly holy of holies before his atoning work was completed. Of course, there are preachers that have preached this and that have, many of them have tied this to what Jesus said to Mary when he said to her, stop clinging to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father in John 20 verse 17. And many preachers have said, well, he, he was anxious to go and take his blood into the heavenly holy of holies. Folks, that's bad theology. It is best for us to understand that when Jesus cried out to tell us die, it is finished on the cross that his atoning work was complete there and that nothing else had to be done. And the best translation of verse 12 is by virtue of his own blood. It is true that the Levitical high priest carried the blood of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. But Jesus did not literally carry his own blood into the heavenly tabernacle. He entered the heavenly tabernacle by virtue of his own shed blood on the cross. And I think Bruce is right, uh, right on target here when he says, when on the cross he offered up his life to God as a sacrifice for his people's sin, he accomplished in reality what Aaron and his successors performed in type. His was the real sacrifice. His was the real shedding of blood. And I believe doctrinal statements have it rightly as the one oblation of Christ finished on the cross. His work was perfectly finished on the cross. So we don't need to see any sort of literal carrying of his blood into the heavenly tabernacle. But there are a couple other details here I think we should note as well. The New American Standard has the phrase once for all, and that is exactly what it means. The Greek word is epipax. It is a word that mean, means once for all time. It is something that never needs to be repeated. In other words, there is no need for any other work of atonement. It is absolutely sufficient. There is nothing you can add to it. You can't add human works to this. You can't add religious requirements. You can't add any system of merit because it is completely sufficient in and of itself. And I don't know about you, but it seems to me that if there is any one truth that we should grasp from the book of Hebrews, it is that Christ has done everything. He's done it all. We can add nothing to the work that he has done. And when you understand that, where else can you go but to understand that the gospel is a gospel of grace? You have to receive it freely by his hand by grace. And then notice in verse 12, what his blood accomplishes for us. Through it, he has obtained for us eternal redemption. Now, the word for redemption there is tied to the concept of ransom. It is a price that was paid to free a captive or a slave. 
those who are redeemed by Christ are set free from sin's guilt forever. Paul said in Romans 3, 24, we who are sinners are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Folks, it can't get any clearer than that. His blood was the ransom price that was paid for our salvation. It was the propitiation, the mercy seat upon which our sins were covered forever. And that salvation is a totally free gift of God's grace to be received by faith in Jesus Christ. So verse 12 then is a succinct summary of Christ's work as mediatorial savior. He has obtained eternal redemption for all who put their faith in Christ alone. But there's more. So we see finally the new significance. Verses 13 and 14 are one sentence. Look at it with me. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is a classic a fortiori argument from lesser to greater. If you look carefully, you can see the conditional clauses, the if then. The first clause states, if the blood of goats and bulls sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, verse 14 supplies the then clause in the form of how much more will the blood of Christ cleanse your conscience. Of course, this is an argument from lesser to greater, which reasons if something is true in a lesser situation, it is true to an even greater degree in a greater situation. The blood of animals is the lesser, the blood of Christ is the greater. And again, the purpose is not to demean the lesser, but to exalt the greater. John MacArthur says, to condense and paraphrase verses 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit is saying, if these old things were so good as symbols, how much better are the real things they symbolize? If the external, physical, and temporary covenant accomplished its purpose so well, how much better will the internal, spiritual, and eternal covenant accomplish its purpose? As weak and as imperfect as the old covenant was, it could, in fact, provide temporary covering for sin. The sacrificial system of the Levitical priesthood was able to deal with sin to a degree, but the provision of the new covenant is far superior to that. The blood of Christ can cleanse the conscience, the inner man. It can provide permanent access to God, that eternal redemption. In fact, the purpose of the old covenant was to symbolize externally the cleansing of sin, while the purpose of the new covenant was to actually internally Remove sin from us forever. You know, the inner man is where sin really exists. And the old covenant wasn't able to deal with that. It couldn't cleanse the conscience, but the new covenant can do what the old covenant never could. It can transform the inner man. It can completely cleanse the heart of the sinner. But there's some details in these two verses I think are important to note as well. First of all, notice the distinction that's made between the blood of goats and bulls as opposed to the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled. 
The first phrase, the blood of goats and bulls, is a general term that refers to both the sacrifices on the Day of Atonement and the daily sacrifices in the temple. The second phrase, the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, points to a special ritual that is described for us in Numbers 19. Here, a special sacrifice was instituted to enable those who were defiled in some way to become ceremonially clean. If an Israelite touched a dead body, for example, he would be unclean for seven days. He could not participate in the worship of Israel as long as he remained unclean. But worse than that, he would become completely cut off from the covenant people if he remained unclean longer than seven days. So there had to be a way for him to become cleansed from his defilement. And this is where the red heifer comes in. For him to be cleansed from his defilement, the people were instructed by God to take a red heifer without blemish that had never worn a yoke and to sacrifice it. Its blood was then to be sprinkled before the tabernacle seven times. Then the heifer's body was to be burned, but the ashes of the heifer were to be kept for the purpose of purification. And any time a person became defiled in any way, they would take some of those ashes and they would mix it with water and they would sprinkle it on the person that had been defiled. This would happen on the third day and then on the seventh day, that person would be clean. This is what the author of Hebrews is referring to here. But I think the main point that he's making is that any kind of sacrifice under the old covenant was always temporary and imperfect. None of the Old Testament sacrifices could accomplish what the new covenant could. All these were external rituals that could only deal with external defilement. They could not transform the heart. They could not cleanse the conscience. They could only cleanse the flesh but not the soul. Therefore, these offerings pale in insignificance in comparison to the sacrifice of Christ. Now, I know we're going a little long, but we're almost finished, so hang on with me. Going back to verse 14, notice the phrase, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. The Without blemish part, of course, speaks of the sinlessness of Christ. Jesus was not without blemish physically, but morally and spiritually. Of course, Leviticus 14.10 tells us under the old covenant, the sacrifices had to be without blemish or defect. This also was a, an imperfect symbol of the perfect fulfillment in Christ. The Old Testament sacrifices were without blemish physically, but Jesus was perfect morally and spiritually. He was sinless. And notice that his sacrifice was made through the eternal spirit. Now, scholars have debated this phrase. I believe it's talking about the fact that everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry, he did it in the power of the Spirit, including his sacrificial death on the cross. And biblically, we would have to say that the work of atonement at the cross was the work of all three persons of the Trinity. But this truth that Jesus accomplished this through the power of of the Spirit really is an admonition of us to live the Christian life in that same power. Wish we had time to develop that. Notice that the result of his atoning work in the new covenant is that we are cleansed in the inner man from dead works to serve the living God. And in closing, you might ask, what are those dead works? Well, 
The dead works for unbelievers, I believe, would be those things that cannot save. Human works cannot save. External rituals cannot save. In the same way that the ceremonies of the old covenant can never bring about full and complete atonement for sin, so dead works can never transform the heart and cleanse the conscience and regenerate the soul. Only Jesus Christ can do that. But for those who are Christians, I believe the dead works are those things we do in the power of the flesh instead of the power of the Spirit. And if we had time, we could go into this more fully. But we have to understand that there are certain things that we do where we may try to earn favor with God, even as Christians, that could be considered dead works. The transformation of the new covenant is intended to free us from all these dead works so that we can serve the living God. Where do you stand with Christ today? Have you experienced the heart transformation of the new covenant? Have you received eternal redemption by putting your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? The famous hymn writer Isaac Watts wrote these profound words, Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain, but Christ, the heavenly lamb, takes all our sins away. A sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. Do you know him today? Is he your Lord and Savior? I pray that he is. If not, will you receive him today? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this rich passage of scripture. Lord, we pray that we would understand it fully. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that does not know Jesus Christ, they would come to know him, that they would put their faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation, that they would receive this eternal redemption that has been purchased through the blood of Christ. Lord, I pray that all of us would respond the way you would want us to as we consider your word in Jesus' name, amen.